Welcome to Building Resilience, a podcast by Hatch for insights around risk management for sound business practices. I'm Mark Zayan. And I'm Joelle Pang, your hosts for today's episode. Today, we have Dr. Johan Dutoit joining us as the guest speaker. Johan is a senior principal with Hatch Advisory who has spent the last couple of years working on a large transformational operational integrity program. So we're excited to learn more about operational integrity. And Johan, we'd first like to know, how would you define operational integrity? Thanks, Joel. Thanks for that question. And thanks, Mert, for the introduction. I mean, if you watch the news, you'll know that in a world of increasingly violent perturbations, I mean, some of them are natural, some of them are industrial, you know, business leaders need to influence what is under their control, because much is not. And operational integrity is one such a goal. For me, it's an emergent property of a management system in which people, processes, and assets are harmonized. The consequences of failure of this operational integrity can be catastrophic, uh, as we have seen in recent and uh, also more past history. So this harmonious combination of people, processes, and assets, it's a socio-technical system, is something that we need to put our, wrap our heads around. In fact, one of the modern terms for it is that it is a complex adaptive system. Now, it reminds me of something I've recently uh, you know, read where somebody reminded us that you know, major accidents in high hazard industries uh, are generally caused by, and then he goes on to say, an unlikely combination of circumstances that wasn't controlled. And why wasn't it controlled? Well, it could either have been due to poor decision making, it could have been due, due to poor communication, or the one that we don't really like to talk about a lot, management pressure for performance at the expense of safety. And, and then the last one that was mentioned caught my eye, where it's an unexpected interactions between different components of complex systems. So just as loss of containment events can arise as a result of unlikely combinations of circumstances or unexpected interactions between different components of complex systems, so the opportunity exists to enable safety to emerge as a property of a harmonized system of people, processes, and assets. Operational integrity should be the goal of every responsible business leader. Thanks, Johan. So given that brief description of what operational integrity is, how do you think risk management plays a role within operational integrity? I think risk management is one of the important tools to achieve operational integrity. So it's a means to an end. I have a, a Hatch colleague, we have a Hatch colleague, uh, Dr. Puya Zangine, and he is a you know a risk PhD, literally. And he's been really influential in my understanding, my growing understanding of the opportunities and limitations of risk analytics and, and the risk analytics tools. And, you know, he talks to me about these probabilistic methods and, you know, the need for a Bayesian approach to reducing uncertainty. Now, that's all really, really important uh, stuff. But that said, risk quantification is really useful for policymakers and for CFOs who need to essentially have an evaluation of how many dollars can this cost the organization, how many people can get harmed, you know, how much environmental damage can get caused. But in the world of tailings dams, where I've spent the last uh, you know, two years uh, laboring away at trying to help make a difference, it's the world of black swans, these low frequency, high impact events. And the industry has decided actually just to concentrate on the consequence side rather than the probability side of things. And since the consequences of failure are so ghastly, you know, miners are expected to reduce the residual risk of such events to what is called ALARP, as low as reasonably practicable. I just want to add to that. I've also been engaged with a number of clients on managing uh, process safety risks. And I agree with Johan on this, that often the high impact, low consequence events get uh, overlooked. Um, certain biases may exist, uh, in, in fact, you know, but it is still important to keep them in mind and have measures and controls in place to, to ensure proper management of those events. So you guys mentioned that certain biases might occur. Do you think there are certain parts of the risk management process where the biases are more prevalent? And are there certain specific biases that should be highlighted? The one I'd like to concentrate on, because there's several, but I'd really like to concentrate on the bias of overconfidence, um, which we need to guard against in risk management efforts. And I think it's particularly at the early stages when you're doing the risk analysis, 
and so on. The risk assessment, early stages of risk management. Because I think there's not only the risk of being overconfident of the team being able to avert disasters, because you know that kind of overconfidence is all too common. I also think it's the overconfidence in the results of the risk assessments. One thing that Puya Zangena has awakened me to is that when you see a Swiss cheese uh, model, it seems to imply that there is an independence between these different barriers, safety barriers, as well as the threats. But of course, there's sometimes an interdependence, which can lead to some of your uh, risk assessment models giving you good answers, but not complete answers. Um, and, and therefore, that is where my interest actually pivots. My interest pivots from risk management, where success is measured in the absence of bad things, to safety management, where success is the creation of safety barriers and resilience. In fact, I'm excited by a future where so-called performance-based approaches to safety management will almost bring us to an, a, a near real-time assessment of the health of an asset as well as the people and processes that are harmonized with it. You know, being able to track the vital statistics for evidence of healthy performance, things like zero drift from the design intent, adherence to operational maintenance and surveillance plans, the existence of training and development opportunities all the way from the classroom to the workplace, and showing effective responses to safety incident reporting. That's where my mind is pivoting to, is to the creation of positive things rather than hoping that the bad things don't eventuate. I agree. And I also want to add to that, that when we're dealing with large transformational programs focusing on process safety, it's also important to always consider uh, transfer of knowledge. Uh, the knowledge acquired through these uh, programs usually end up with large amounts of data in terms of controls and mitigation measures. But unless that knowledge and that culture is transferred to the people on site, you know, most of the time we go back to the circle of overconfidence because top level leaders believe they've got themselves covered, but the bottom is disconnected. Speaking about leadership, what do you think leadership's role is in managing risks for operational integrity? And what do you think some of the biggest challenges are? So, so we've heard about the risk of overconfidence. And of course, I didn't mention things like groupthink, but I agree with Mert about the role of leadership in shaping culture. Sometimes we think of a safety culture, but it's, it's really the organizational culture. One of my colleagues said today that he would think of an organization as being a set of conversations. And this is how I'm starting to see how leaders can shape a culture, because we can have environments where there are unwritten rules about the things you cannot say and the things that you can say. And if we want open and transparent dialogue, if we want the revealing and the exposing of problems so that they can be solved in a timely manner, that does presuppose that we address those things where we discourage people from saying certain things. It's one thing to encourage people to speak truth to power and so on. But if leaders don't show that in their behavior, they are truly inquisitive when they go and do a visible felt leadership visit to a you know, frontline place. If they all seem to be there to be checking up and looking for, 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 for errors, things that can be criticized later on, people will tend to always put on the, you know, the bright, you know, sunny side of things, rather than actually having a culture where we can talk about you know, shortcomings, surprises, anomalies. We need to have a plan, do, check, act cycle, which is based upon learning flowing from surprises and not hiding things. So leaders have a very powerful role to play in creating such a positive open culture. I agree. I agree. And on that mention of culture, I also want to add to that um, the fact that if you can implement a culture in open and transparent process safety management, you will essentially empower the people on site to be able to share their experiences, positive and negative, and that will lead to an overall successful program and safer operations. I think that's what empowerment looks like. It's not some other thing where you have a, a new motto or you essentially, you know, hand out you know coffee cups with inspirational logos on them. It's actually exactly. helping people to be the best they can be at work, to make the greatest contribution they can. Definitely. So given all these great insights that you've just shared with us, um, can you give us an example of where there was an operational integrity problem and um, how it was approached and what the outcome was? 
So let me go to my current two-year experience with one of our global mining uh, clients, uh, where they recognize the need to urgently address their challenges around operational integrity when it came to doing the safety management for their dams. So Hatch was invited in to really do a complete white paper exercise with them to talk about a top-down design. So if one leaned into all the best practice that is available in the world and customized it for our client, they said that's what they want. They don't want to go through a long, tortuous process of assessing where they are currently weak. They would like us to start to come up with with them collaboratively a design for this uh, best practice tailings and dam management system. So earlier on, I spoke about uh, assets and I spoke about processes and people. So not surprisingly, our work focused on those kinds of elements. I led the organizational work stream, which you can imagine looked very um, clearly at the people side, but of course it also touched into the processes, particularly the governance processes that help ensure the safety of dams. So it's been a two year journey, lots and lots of material was gathered, was collated, was customized. So we've got to the point now where we can declare victory that the design and the the elements of the system are well in hand. They are established in the organization. But now we have to get to the point where we have to harmonize the people, process, and the assets. Of course, the assets are themselves not alive, although some people would argue that a tailing storage facility is something that grows and evolves and does show some unusual behaviors for an industrial asset. And we are now at that part of the journey where we are looking at what does it truly take to embed these new processes, to look after these assets with the people that you have. And it's something which gets revealed every time we take a step, the next parts of that journey get illuminated. So it's an ongoing journey, but I'm confident that we are progressing steadily in the right direction with our client. Yes. And to add to that, one of my current engagements is with another global client of ours, where like the the conversation from the previous question, you know, getting involvement from the, the people on the ground, right? Uh, having buy-in from everyone who's doing the work on a day-to-day basis. So on this program, we um, kicked off by uh, rolling out process safety management at one site identified. And uh, looking at the 20 elements of the risk-based process safety, we evaluated their maturity level. And from there, we're able to develop a plan for the client to really mature to that step of process safety management that you know needs to be incorporated. The result is going to be a successful um, implementation, and we look forward to rolling that out to all of their um, operations around the globe. I'm glad you mentioned process safety. Um, alert listeners will realize that a process safety management system, if you want to find one of the finest examples in the world, it's the one from Exxon Mobil, and it's called the Operational Integrity Management System. So Operational Integrity Management Systems are process safety management systems. So thank you for just highlighting that, Mert. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we attach uh, the unique value proposition because we can not only look at the the operational integrity from an advisory standpoint, but we're also able to bring in our technical subject matter experts into the equation and look at things from both technical and business advisory side. We'll be able to evaluate the impact of you know uh, the required actions. And in many cases, we'll be able to incorporate those actions and be there till the end with our clients. And don't forget our digital colleagues. They also are key enablers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well-rounded, one-stop shop. That's what we are. Well, thank you both for sharing your insights and for providing such great examples on what um, we do. That's all the time we have for today's episode. Thank you, Johan, for joining us today. And thank you all for tuning in.